Here's a question for you. How do you convey musically a sense of speed, the sensation of velocity, the feeling, let us say, that you're cruising on the highway in a big, beautiful American car, the wind in your hair, or diving in a hang glider over a landscape that would take hours to cross on foot? That sensation, the sensation of speed, is it possible to represent it musically? And how would you do that? Of course, I wouldn't raise the question if the answer were totally obvious. It may seem obvious that the way to do it is simply to speed up a piece of music, just like you would speed up the car, step on the gas to experience the thrill and exhilaration of pure locomotion. But no, in music, that doesn't work at all. It's easy to show this, for in recent decades, the fashion in early music performance has been to adopt ever faster speeds, faster and faster, as if performers were in a race for the finish line. So there's plenty of pieces that you can hear performed at very different speeds in different recordings, usually decades apart. And the question is whether those recordings at faster speeds also convey a greater subjective sensation of speed. Let's take as an example the Vivaldi Concerto that we have been talking about. Now here's the first ritornello in a recording from 1976, more than 40 years ago. Well, this is in the direction of what you might call a stately pace. It's by no means sluggish, but it's not exactly a thrill ride either. Now let's take another recording about 20 years later, in which the performers managed to do the same thing, but about one and a half times as fast. <laughs> Certainly this is not a stately pace, and it's undeniably fast, but I wouldn't say it conveys a sense of speed. For one thing, it feels just too nervous and too agitated, as if I were struggling with all my might on a kid's tricycle to keep up with a slow-moving car. The thing that is lacking in this fast recording is a sense of momentum, the sense of effortless speed, where you take your foot off the pedal and the car still keeps floating along. You'll never get that by speeding up a Baroque concerto. The reason for this is that speed has to be relative to something. If you perform the whole work faster, then everything still has the same speed relative to everything else. It's like when all cars on the highway simultaneously go from 40 miles an hour to 70. I will still feel that my speed is about average. If I really want to have the sensation of speed, I should probably be going 70 while everybody else is going 40. This is how you could think of the string orchestra that Vivaldi used in his concerto. You see the keyboard there in the middle. That is one half of the basso continuo. The other half is a double bass there at two o'clock. The rest of the instruments are what we call tutti, the full orchestra. As a group, they're like the cars on the highway, all going at the same speed, whether 40 or 70. In a fast movement, Vivaldi will simply indicate allegro, Italian for cheerful. But in the slow movement, he will write adagio or largo instead. It won't make any difference if you expand the orchestra with wind instruments, like trumpets say, or horns. They too will go at the same speed as everybody else. But around 1750, smack in the middle of the 18th century, a small but significant change occurs. Two instruments, the French horn and the oboe, become a standard part of the orchestra, nearly always in pairs, that is, two horns, two oboes. Take this painting from 1753. You can recognize the same parts of the orchestra I showed you a moment ago. First, you have the basso continuo, 
a keyboard instrument plus two gambas or cellos. Then you have the strings, only five of them here, which is not a lot. But then this is a private orchestra, the friends and household musicians of the Bishop of Liège in Belgium. Then we see a small group of wind instruments. They are behind the violins because they tend to be louder and should not be allowed to overshout the rest of the orchestra. If we now look at this wind section in more detail, we find that it includes only two kinds of instruments, the French horn and the oboe. There's two of each of them. If you're not familiar with the sound of these instruments, go to one of the memorized quizzes that I've made for this course. It helps you recognize the various instruments of the orchestra. Here's what the horn and the hoboe sound like in the samples I took for the memorized quizzes. As you can tell, these instruments can be quite tuneful, but that is not the reason why they became a standard part of the orchestra around 1750. They may play melodies on occasion, but their principal contribution is the creation of a quite different kind of sound. And they do that by playing a single note indefinitely. First, the oboes. And now the horns. And now the oboes and horns together. This may not sound like the most interesting music in the world, but actually it will prove astonishingly effective as music. To illustrate this, let's take an early symphony by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, item number 64 in the awesome mix. Mozart was a wunderkind, an infant prodigy, perhaps the most naturally gifted musician who ever lived. He was born into a world where the fashionable music was typically light, elegant, stylish, airy, and agreeable, which was really the most that mere vibration of air could aspire to. If music had higher pretensions, it would need poetry to convey some message, or it would have to aspire to the decidedly unfashionable learning that Bach invested in his fugues. But in this symphony, you can hear what was truly fashionable and popular in Europe around the time of the Boston Tea Party. And indeed, the music is absolutely delightful. We will watch a video of Mozart's symphony, and this screen capture shows you the setup of the orchestra. Naturally, the core of the orchestra is provided by the strings. There is enough of them here to create a pretty full-bodied sound. So you don't really need a keyboard instruments to supply chords in a basso continuo. Besides, with this many string instruments, you're probably not going to hear the harpsichord anyway. Then there are the wind instruments, two oboes and two horns. As I said before, they can be pretty loud, so it's best to position them behind the strings. But one of the things I liked about this particular video is that the wind instruments are still quite prominent in the overall mix. It truly makes a delicious sound. Such a shame that often you scarcely hear these wind instruments at all. Now let's go to the video. It lasts a little less than two minutes, and most of the time you'll hear the strings alone. It's only at calculated moments that the oboes and horns join in. When they do, there will be a reminder on the screen. A picture of two oboes and two horns will appear in the bottom left corner, and they will light up with a golden glow to indicate the rays of sunshine they add to the orchestral sound.
Now, there's one thing we can tell from the way the opposing horns are treated here. They're not meant to generate a sense of speed. The opposite is true. The sounds they produce are totally static. If anything, it's their lack of motion that makes the rest of the orchestra seem fast by comparison. All this is a new effect, unknown in the time of Vivaldi, Bach and Handel. Of course, they did know of horns and oboes, and they used them often enough. It's just that they didn't use them in this way. Composers in those days might well have thought, what is the point of having some cars move at 40 and others at 70? Let's go back to that Fugato by Bach that so brightened Peter Quill's day on the abandoned planet of Moorhead. In this piece, there's two oboes in addition to the string orchestra. And yet, they're playing the same busy work as the violins and are not allowed to move at a slower pace. Or in fact, it might be better to say that the oboes cannot move at a slower pace. This has to do with a concept known as harmonic rhythm. Essentially, this term means the rate at which chords change. In Baroque music, like that of Bach, Handel and Vivaldi, there tends to be a pretty fast harmonic rhythm. Chords change quickly, often as quickly as once every beat. If you have measures with four beats each, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That means four chord changes every measure in rapid succession. Let me illustrate this with the help of the Baroque composer we encountered in the previous lecture, Arcangelo Corelli, and his trio sonata for two violins and basso continuo. It's item number 46 in the awesome mix. Remember what I said about the trio sonata. It's three because there's two solo violins plus one basso continuo. It's true, as I said, that the basso continuo is played on two instruments, but there's only one stave. The two instruments can share one stave because one of them needs only a melody, and that is the gamba. The other instrument is a harpsichord, and its job is to play chords. The easiest way to notate chords is with the help of figures. That's why a basso continuo is also called a figured bass. Now look at those figures underneath the lowest of the three voice parts in the score. There's a new figure on pretty much every beat of the measure. Sometimes there isn't a new one, like on the second beat of the second measure. But at that point you'll notice there is a new note in the gamba, and there has to be a new chord on that note as well. You can't hold on to the previous chord here. The only reason why there is no number printed in the score is that the default chord is always the triad. So when there's no number, you know that you have to play a triad. And at this point, there is a new chord. Let's play this sample twice. First, as it is recorded by two violins and continuo in the awesome mix. But now we're going to play the second time, and what we'll be hearing is only one half of the basso the figured part, that is, the chords on the keyboard. Now you'll be hearing what I meant by fast harmonic rhythm. This piece chugs along like a locomotive. It never changes pace. It stays in the same rhythm throughout.
My point here is that when harmonic rhythm is this fast, there's no way to hold a single note in either the oboe or the horn, at least not for a very long time, because there's guaranteed to be a chord very soon that clashes with that single note. And to avoid that clash, you'll need to change pitch. So from this point of view, we should not really be surprised by that fugato by Bach, which I played a moment ago, in which the oboes were just as busy as the violins. They really had no choice. There's one important thing we can tell from this. When oboes and horns can sustain single notes as long as they did in that Mozart symphony, sounding the same pitch for seconds on end, it means that the harmonic rhythm must be a lot slower than in Corelli. The chords that change so rapidly in the trio sonata must be sounding much longer here. And exactly that is what we see happening in music of the late 18th century. I'm now going to play an example by another composer from this period, Joseph Haydn. Again, it's a symphony, and again, the orchestration is strings plus two oboes and two horns. But this time, the composer goes out of his way to convey a genuine sense of speed, the kind of thing I asked about at the beginning of this lecture. He starts right away at what feels like 100 miles an hour. Okay, 90. Now, before I play the symphony, which, by the way, is item 63 in the awesome mix, I should note that it was written around the same time as the Mozart symphony in the video. Haydn composed his symphony in the year before the Tea Party, Mozart the year after. The symphony by Haydn is one of his so-called Sturm und Drang symphonies. This refers to a curious fashion in 1770s Germany called Sturm und Drang. I've translated that expression here as storm and drive. Now these very words by themselves already convey a sense of speed. They come from a theatrical play whose title I've shown here. This play too is a product of the 1770s. Now this fashion, Sturm und Drang, or storm and drive, was everything to do with emotional intensity. A storm is something that happens in the world outside, but metaphorically, we can still apply the idea of a storm to our inner world, the world of our emotions, feelings, and changing moods. Drang, on the other hand, or drive, is by definition part of the inner life of humans. It suggests an unstoppable yearning, a restless seeking of some kind of fulfillment, and a life in which that fulfillment is not immediately forthcoming. The most evocative expression of this movement was a genre of painting devoted entirely to ships caught in wild stormy seas, as if they were human souls tossed about by the storms of life and the turbulence of their own emotions. I decided to take this idea of shipwreck as the guiding idea in the following video clip. I had to look for some good footage to combine with the music, and I found it in the movie Pirates of the Caribbean at World's End of 2007. Enjoy. Remember now the Vivaldi Concerto. We can speed up that piece as much as we like, but it's never going to have the unstoppable momentum of Haydn's symphony. And that is because the speed in Haydn's work is relative to something that is slow. It is relative to its slow harmonic rhythm. How slow is that? Well, let me give you an example. In the previous lecture, I played a brief sample of a work for solo violin composed by Johann Sebastian Bach, quite possibly after the tragic death of his first wife in 1720. It's the Chacon of his violin partita, an exceedingly powerful work reckoned among the greatest compositions ever written. Here it is again.
You would not call this a composition at high tempo. For a piece of Bach's time, it does indeed have a very slow harmonic rhythm. And the tempo indication is andante, moderately slow. And yet I can take that very slow harmonic rhythm and find another piece that begins with the same chords, played at exactly the same tempo, but sounding like the Amtrak thundering through Princeton Junction. Here are those chords played on the piano alone. And now we're going to take those same piano chords and mix them into an orchestral composition that is like the Amtrak train. You guessed it. It is Haydn's symphony, the epitome of storm and drive. Now, I mixed in the piano here to bring this out. I needed something that would emphasize the slow moving chords themselves because it's difficult to isolate them from the mass of orchestral sound. But of course, you can also mix in something else to underscore the same point. For example, two oboes and two horns. And here is what that looks like in a score. The strings are neatly grouped together. And look at the small notes they play. Look at the highest string part, which comes tumbling down at heedless pace again and again. And then look at the wind instruments on top of them, a layer moving seemingly at glacial pace. It may seem as if there is a new note every measure in the wind parts, but in fact, most of these are connected by so-called ties. This means that the note is to, help, to be held continuously across the line of the measure. So what you see at the top of the slide is notes held sometimes as long as four measures. The contrast with the strings could scarcely be more striking. So here is the combined effect of all this. I've now indicated the sustained notes with blue lines, making it perhaps easy to appreciate the contrast between the two simultaneously moving layers. All this is part of a much bigger picture. What you've just witnessed in Mozart and Haydn is the attempt to gain compositional control over speed, or at least over the subjective sensation of musical speed. I just noted that Haydn begins the symphony right away at 100 miles an hour. But what if you wanted to build that up? What if you want to begin an orchestral work in the quietest possible way, at the slowest imaginable speed, and then accelerate all the way to the maximum speed at which the symphony now begins? That is a creative challenge no composer had tackled before. And it is one to which 18th century composers would find remarkable solutions. Solutions that are still being applied in music today. Believe it or not, I will illustrate just this point with the help of Spider-Man 2, the unbelievably awesome soundtrack by Danny Elfman. The first time I watched that movie with my kids, it felt like I was witnessing the beginning of an epic story, a timeless tale that would capture the human condition in all its flaws and glories, that would show us immortal heroes engaged in a combat for the very existence of the universe. Or so the music seemed to suggest. What a letdown the rest of the movie turned out to be. But that must wait. For now, I want to make only one further point. The contrast between slow harmonic rhythm on the one hand and high paced motion on the other, can be recognized also in a new musical device that became very popular in the late 18th century. It is the so-called Alberti bass. 
It makes it possible to do on the piano what Haydn and Mozart did in their symphony orchestras. You take a chord, hold it static, but break it up into small notes which infuse it with speed, like this. And now listen to the beginning of a piano sonata by the youngest son of Bach, Johann Christian. Notice how, in the most unemphatic way, the piece is immediately given a gentle momentum, and how at the very end of this clip, that momentum is already being stepped up. Of course, at the end of the day, all this is and remains mere vibration of air, at least if you want to look at it that way. And some of the people, some people in the 18th century might well have said that the subjective sense of speed is merely an empty thrill, a sensation as devoid of meaning as driving a car or scratching your leg or stretching your muscles. Should music not convey knowledge, understanding, morals, lessons? And is music not fatally incapable of doing just that? Should it not at least seek things like complicated fugues, sonata forms, tonal coherence, intricate forms, compositional plans, to reclaim the substance it was no longer thought to have in this period? To be continued.